Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're looking at compound verbs on page 50 and 51 of Jeremy Duff's book, Elements of New Testament Greek. We're in section 4.4 and as a special treat today, when we look at this little word here, I'm going to introduce you to a theme which is important for thinking about how to use language and to how to avoid making some basic mistakes in reading uh, the New Testament and indeed the Bible as a whole. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, compound verbs, what are they? A compound verb is very simply a verb which is made up from a compound of a verb plus a preposition. And the verb and the preposition join together to form a new word. So here's an example. Ballo means I throw. Ek is a preposition, preposition meaning from in the sense of out from. Uh, and, f, and the meaning of ek ballo means um, I drive out or I throw out. Now, that raises a uh, danger in the minds of many students because having observed that ek ballo means I drive out or I throw out, we are, uh, want to <laughs> infer that the meaning of compound verbs in general can be derived by adding together the meanings of their component parts. Now that's a mistake. It is a mistake to think that in general the meaning of a compound verb can be inferred from its component parts added together. Think of a compound verb as a linguistic version of a chemical compound. The, the, uh, the compound water is a compound of hydrogen and oxygen, but its properties are not a kind of mixture of the properties of hydrogen and oxygen. They're completely different properties altogether. Well, a compound verb is somewhat analogous to that in the sense that the properties of the word in general terms cannot be figured out by just adding together the properties, so to speak, the definitions of the component parts. And for an example of that, this word here, parakaleo. Now, let's just look at the component parts. The verb is kaleo, which means I call. So stick that in here, I call. Para is a preposition meaning beside or alongside. Um, so let's stick that here. And on the basis of this, many a sermon has been preached in which it is said that when Jesus promises a paraclete, it's the word which is related to parakaleo when he's promising the Holy Spirit to his disciples in the farewell discourse in John's Gospel. When Jesus promises to send the paraclete to be with you, he's promising that there will be one who is called alongside you. One who will be with you always because he is kaleo para you, he is parakaleo. He is the paraclete, he is the one who is called aside. Now that's wonderful theology and it's terrible exegesis because in general terms, remember, the meaning of a compound verb cannot be inferred by adding together the meanings of its component parts. In fact, parakaleo means something more like I encourage or I exhort or I comfort. It doesn't have to do with the motion of being called alongside someone and being alongside them. It's more to do with the action that they do once they're beside you. They comfort you, they encourage, they exhort you, or they teach you. Not teach, teach would be a different verb, but that's the sense of it. So that's the first thing to watch out for. And when you're reading commentaries, when you're preaching sermons, when you're listening to sermons and giving uh, your thoughts afterwards, well, give them graciously and gently, but um, there's a great temptation, and you find this even in books, which is why preachers like yourself, if you're a preacher and me, will be tempted to make this mistake if you don't know a little bit about how language works. It is a great temptation to think that the meaning of a word like this can be built up from the, meaning, the meanings of the component parts. It can't. Any more than a dandelion is a mixture of a dandy and a lion. Obviously, that's not either. Now, one more final point about this. Uh, here's an example of a compound verb in which we've got a phenomenon that we looked at previously when we were thinking about prepositions, the phenomenon of elision. Apago. Apago is a compound of apo and ago. Apo meaning from or away from, and ago meaning I lead or I bring. Now notice what's happened here. In forming the compound, the Omicron at the end of apo has done exactly what you'd expect it to do if it were bumped up against a word beginning with a vowel. The Omicron has elided. So we don't have apoago, apoago, we have apago, apago. And remember, this is just what you'd expect to happen because this is a phenomenon that arises from how we speak language, not how we write it down. And actually when you're speaking, what you get is a continuous stream of sound. You don't get the words separated by 
gaps like this, it all comes out in a continuous stream of sound. So from the point of view of speaking, it's just as important to lose the Omicron in a single word like apago as it would be in two words like apake from the beginning, apake. Uh, you wouldn't say apoake, you'd say apake. Okay, so there's some thoughts about compound verbs. We're going to see these a great deal more because these uh, compound verbs introduce some complications a little bit later on when we're thinking about um, different tenses of verbs. But all that fun is in store for you in the future. For now, keep working hard 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day on your Greek. If you do that five or six days a week, then I can guarantee in a year or two, we'll have you reading the New Testament in the original language. For now, God bless. See you next time. <laughs>